So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Easy Generator panel discussion on the future of corporate training. We're really looking forward to this discussion. We have four fabulous learning and development experts here with us today. Um, they have a huge wealth of learning and development experience between them, working in lots of different organizations with very different um, focus areas, whether that's in internal training, external training, decentralizing training, compliance, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots for everyone here today in terms of the areas of expertise that we have amongst our panelists. And we wanted to host this panel discussion today because we know that with um, the shift to global and the shift to remote working that we've seen over the last year or two, training is really having to have a bit of a redesign and we're having to really think about how we implement training and learning and development within our organizations. So we wanna be able to share some wisdom today um, around the future of corporate training, the role of e-learning in corporate training, what the secret to a successful training strategy really is, um, and the impact that, get it, that, that getting that strategy right can have on your organization. So I'll be moderating the discussion. I'm Louise Puddyfoot. Um, I come from a background leading learning and development in corporate, primarily for Nielsen, um, where we centralized training and I led various functions within the learning and de development department in my time there. Um, and I now run a small learning and development consultancy called Willow and Puddyfoot and do a lot of work with Easy Generator to help their clients um, move to an uh, employee generated learning approach. Within our panelists, we have Cecile Tustad from Electrolux, we have Mikhail Brandt from SHV Energy, Frederic Herbert from Danone, and Bart Lloyd from Rebecca. Um, so I will ask them all to tell you a little bit more about themselves. Um, so panelists, um, let's start with you, Cecile. Um, if we can hear a quick introduction, introduction from you and a little bit about what excites you about learning and training at the moment. Yeah, really good. So hi, Louise, and hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today. And I look forward to your questions and your comments afterwards as well in the Q&A session. So my name is Cecilia Tistad, and I've spent the last 20 years uh, in competence and capability development. Uh, I work in large global organizations with uh, Ericsson and Sunvik, and also the five last years I've been with uh, Electrolux. And Electrolux is a company that produces home appliances. Uh, at Electrolux, I am heading the uh, European training function uh, and responsible together with a number of trainers for the training of all of our customers in Europe, as well as our service partners, and of course, our own employees. Uh, and we're training all of them on creating outstanding consumer experiences. Uh, and when it comes to kind of like what inspires me, et cetera, I think that, and I mean, I'm so certain that you guys agree with me, that working with uh, learning and development, we have like the best job in the world, uh, because I mean, we instill confidence and confidence in people, setting up for success, on a daily basis. I mean, what could be more rewarding than that? Uh, so I really love what I'm doing. And I always say that I'm, I have the best job in the world. Uh, so I think that's a good inspiration to start maybe. Yeah, great. Thank you. I totally agree. I feel like I have the best <laughs> job in the world too. I feel like we're very fortunate. Thank you. Mikhail, let's hear from you. Thank you, Louisa. Well, it's quite uh, hard to top this one, um, but I'll try. So uh, my name is uh, Michiel Grant. Uh, I work for uh, SHV Energy, which is a Dutch uh, family-owned enterprise uh, with the global operations in the energy business. Um, I work there as a group learning and development manager, and I have a background mainly in management development, so more on soft skills, although today I focus both on training, corporate learning and development. Um, yeah, also me, I love my job. It's a great mm -hmm. company to do it especially the function is really nice uh, because I think for all of us, so not for me and Cecilia and Louise, but those for the whole audience, we go through very exciting times with all the change around in the globe, but also in society, in business. I think it's very important that us as people, we make sure that we stay in shape and stay fit for the corporate future. And by saying this, I mean uh, within our company, we have a strong vision that HR together with uh, the business together with the individual takes care of each and everyone's employability and that is where learning comes around the corner 
we all need to develop ourselves continuously to really stay up to par with all the change around us. So I think it's a very interesting time to be in learning. And I look forward to the coming, let's say, hour uh, to, uh, uh, to be with you guys, not only the panel, but especially with the audience. So looking forward to the Q&A as well. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Mikhail. Yeah, that um, need to continually be learning and developing and upskilling ourselves just gets faster and faster, doesn't it? As uh, things keep developing, it becomes more and more essential. A to you, Bart. Thanks, Louise. And uh, Michiel, you did very well to top that. So uh, now it's my turn to try. <laughs> <laughs> my name is uh, Bart Loya. I'm uh, working at uh, Robico. Uh, that's an asset management company uh, based in Rotterdam, but uh, uh, globally uh, uh, located as well. Uh, I'm the head of the learning and development department. And together with my two colleagues, uh, we, uh, we try to facilitate all our Robico colleagues in, uh, in uh, taking the next step and learning. My uh, background is uh, in HR, but also in sports. Um, I have a background in field hockey. I participated as an athlete in the Barcelona 92 Olympics and uh, as a, a part of the coaching staff in the Beijing 2008 Olympics with the Dutch women, where we got a gold medal. So that is an, an, a very great experience to, to uh, be part of. And uh, for me, uh, that also... Um, so I'm very happy to work in this area as well, learning and development. Uh, there's a connection with sport, of course, in how you can improve, but also in how the way you can facilitate and help people to get uh, on the next level. And that's what I like in uh, being in uh, learning and development, to really help people to get to the next level and sometimes also uh, make them aware that there is something else you can achieve and help them to, to make that uh, um, awareness, but also look in the possibilities they have. Thanks, Louise. Thank you, Bart. Yeah, helping people reach their full potential is really rewarding, isn't it? A real privilege. Thank you. And good to hear about the Olympics as well, of course. Frederick. So I'm Frederick Eber. I'm leading at, uh, I'm, I'm working at Danone, so I hope uh, you know us because uh, we are trying to sell our product uh, uh, at, uh, at scale worldwide. So we're operating in three big markets, waters, uh, fresh dairy product and special nutrition. And uh, my role at Danone is uh, leading the team in charge of digital technologies and innovation uh, for learning. So I've been in Danone for a couple of years uh, in this L&D digital space for almost 10 years in big corporation like Danone. And I'm not coming from L&D. In fact, I'm coming from the IT world and I have shift to L&D because I'm maybe because in my family, everybody was a teacher and uh, mm -hmm. I bridge that with uh, my IT art, my digital art with uh, learning. And um, and uh, this is uh, what I'm doing and what I like in, uh, in this, uh, I mean, in this job is we're helping people. We are getting, we are here to support them, not to ask them to do something mm -hmm. or give them as tasks to do. We are really here to support them. And this is especially, I mean, more true. It's always been true, but it's, it's accelerating right now. So in this new world transition, being there, it's for me quite important. We are here to support them in this new world. So that's what I like to do on my daily job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great to be helping people, supporting them into their new world. And I'm sure that IT expertise that you bring to the role mm -hmm. must uh, be really powerful. Thank you, Frederick. So you've heard who our panelists are and we have um, some questions we'll be discussing with them. There'll also be an opportunity for you to ask the panelists your own questions. We will have a broad Q&A at the end. So if you ha do have questions for the panelists, you can use the Q&A button um, within this webinar, within this, this session um, and submit your questions there and then we'll come to as many as we can at the end of the session today. So, Let's, it'd be good to understand a little bit more about why learning is really important at the moment to you, the organisations that you're working with and any particular kind of changes that you're trying to make at the moment, anything in particular trying to implement at the moment, what's the kind of journey that learning is going through in your organisations at the moment? Cecil, shall I come back to you to start? Do that. It seems like an order we can appear. That's nice. I always go first. I like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> then I don't have to talk to you guys. No, but I mean, uh, I, I think we all recognize that, especially the digital journey, right? And for us in um, Electrolux Europe, we have more or less uh, one or two trainers in each uh, country. And you can imagine being responsible then for training all of the customers, but also the service partners and their employees. Uh, that is really hard. And when I joined uh, Electrolux, that was my assignment to move us from 99% face to face 
into digital. So I'm not saying replacing, but it's extending, right? So we really wanted to extend our reach and be able to deliver, you know, within the day and have that kind of like uh, just-in-time training uh, as you're getting, for instance, a new appliance to the, the floor of the store that you're working in, that is the exact time that you will do the training. And even if maybe you got like a full, I don't know, portfolio training uh, a few weeks uh, earlier, you can do that quick repetition again about what was the key kind of like consumer uh, benefits, for instance, right? So to be able to kind of like extend our reach, reach everyone and not just the ones we can manage to get through with face to face, but also that part about enabling retention, as we all know, right, that the, the mother of all learning is to repeat things. And e-learning and live webinars has been really instrumental in this journey. And of course, then with the pandemic coming in and pushing fast forward on the full transformation, I mean, like, it's amazing to see. I mean, in our industry, uh, both the customers, but also our own employees, we're a little bit, you know, our industry is not like, you know, this digital maybe. And now, of course, everyone is digital, right? Uh, and I don't say that face-to-face -face is going to disappear, uh, but more that its use is going to be optimized, I would say. Yeah, mm. thank you. I'm not sure what I should stick to the order. Uh, but just to quickly uh, chip in, Louise, I, I fully uh, agree with Cicely. Um, although uh, what also is, I think, important to flag is uh, with the pandemic, we heavily invested in our infrastructure, uh, so IT technology. Yeah. So we migrated away from uh, 13 different learning management systems to one single platform. And in that single platform, you try to combine all the different corporate academies uh, we have. So um, I think Cicely is also relating with to sales and then instruction videos. Whereas, uh, of course, you can also think of change management, innovation, like all the different corporate academies that are in place. So we're really in the process to bundle our forces technology-wise, but also mm -hmm. to make sure we get all the uh, expertise and all the academies in one single uh, single place. Not only accessible for white collars, but of course also for uh, the most important people we have in the business, our blue collar workers. And that is really where you see the, the, the change happening these days. Um, that because of the investment in infrastructure and technology, that learning is uh, becoming more widely accessible throughout the organization. Mm. Thanks both. Yeah, and that, that shift to digital is obviously a commonplace thing that we're seeing in organizations at the moment, obviously accelerated um, by COVID. Um, but it, it's interesting, isn't it? The benefits that come with that in terms of being able to reach more people and be able to, to take that retention approach that you mentioned, Cecile, so be able, people being able to have those reminders. Thank you. Yeah, maybe maybe to add to that, Louise, uh, um, also, uh, we have also changed our structure uh, and, and uh, with an LMS that gives us more the opportunity to, to um, send out the e-learnings the e or the content you want to certain groups. Uh, so you don't send it to all, all the company, but you can divide that as well uh, and, and uh, have a cooperation with an uh, e-learning provider uh, like LinkedIn. You can you can really uh, make sure that, that people get what they want. That's one thing that, that really um, helped us to, uh, to get the right content to the right people. And on the other hand, also to get more insight in, in uh, you also have the mandatory uh, e-learnings you have to do. You get more insight in, in uh, where, where to send those to and to make sure that everybody has done that. So that's that's our two things that we are using, but we are also using this to make sure that uh, as a global company, you you give the the, the same uh, content to people you want to. Uh, and we did uh, an e-learning, for instance, for uh, the end of year meetings our managers need to do. And so in, in a couple of years, we choose to to do that face to face. But now also we uh, we've made an e-learning uh, with actors uh, to make sure to see uh, to show certain situations and, and how can you improve those situations. Uh, and that gives also a real benefit. So you have the same basis for everybody. And then on top of that, you can choose that people, if, if they want to specialize or to, to know more on certain situations or uh, they want to learn more on what they need to do, they, they can, uh, can ask and improve on those uh, particular specialties. Mm. Thank you, Bart. And on my side, I try to add something that has not been said already, but uh, luckily, I don't want to say we were prepared be before the COVID, but we were lucky to have only one LMS already in place mm -hmm. and already have transitioned to a learning expense platform. So we had the, I mean, the chance to be able to react quickly. Um, so to not add something that has been said, the most important thing that I'm trying to, to, to do now at Danone, and this is where digital can 
help us to to move at scale and also decrease the cost. It's um, to come back on this type of buzzword upskilling, reskilling that have been said for the last couple of years. It's also to try to create this mindset in the company of curiosity. I do believe in this topic, and digital help us to do that because we can at scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say broadcast, deliver a lot of content to create this mindset of really curious. And this is connected to what I said before, my IT background, where when you're in IT, you always you have to be curious because everything is changing at six months. And this curve of learning that I've faced 20 years ago, now people are facing, facing it in their new job. So this is try to create this mindset. Be curious, guys, because if you wait too much, you will miss the train. So this is really a big part about, about it. And this is also something that now it's connecting to a user engagement. It's also about how you making sure through digital channels, your content is consumed. People are looking at it, are in, I mean, informed about it. So there is a lot of topics about, I mean, at least at Danone, around digital is not only provide digital, it makes sure that people is aware about it and consume the content, or at least using them when they want on the spot. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So a consistent theme is kind of that move to much more digital that we're seeing in the broader industry as well, isn't it? And, and many of our training strategies involve that shift to digital. Um, and it's interesting to hear the, how you're all doing that um, and how the benefits of reaching a big audience, of being able to have topics, like you said, Bart, about, you know, your managers having their year-end reviews, something that we see in most organizations and being able to give them really useful training to support that, as well as really targeted training for specific needs. I'm curious to know what kind of impact you've seen as you've made those changes. So as you've gone more digital, you've probably implemented more e-learning type approaches. Um, I know you obviously will work with Easy Generator as well. What kind of impact has that had? Do you want yeah. me to go to you, Frederick, first this time, so that I'm making it a bit fair for you? <laughs> I mean, uh, so, I mean, one of the, it's difficult, I mean, uh, there is a lot of things to say about it. Uh, one of the key things I'm trying to do also, uh, which is, uh, I will say, um, uh, a little bit different, uh, that's what we're doing before, is democratize it, so try to break the silo. So I'm trying to avoid to make uh, learning, uh, uh, I mean, digital learning available to one people or one list set of people trying to democratize maximum of learning. Um, then on the, I mean, that's one of the key things uh, we are doing. It's testing new concepts, not be scared about failing and trying to uh, iterate on new things because I mean, what has been working for years, I mean, will be different tomorrow. Um, and also one of the big shifts that we're trying to do in terms of digital learning, uh, it's also who is in charge of it. Because we used to be, uh, I would say, LND in charge of it. I do believe uh, that the community can now, now be a big uh, actor on creating the content. So relying on the expertise that is in the company, on the SME directly. So that's why we are partnering with this generator to allow anyone in the company to create their own learning I mean, content and share it. So that's one of the key elements. So moving from what I call the, the you, me, we. So you, you have to do this compliance content. Me, mm -hmm. I want to do that to a weak concept that is much more collectively together. We learn from each other. So that I will say that's the most, um, I mean, uh, element that we are doing. And, and the last one, after that, I'm giving the floor to the other panelists. It's also try to use the same concept that we, are, we have exter I mean, externally on our daily life. So what we see in our daily life, we are used to that. It's try to replicate uh, and not be trying to recreate the wheel. So really copying the same concept that we found outside the company and bring that inside. So be more organic, connected, open, transparent. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, for yeah, it, Bart. Yeah, maybe to, to add, uh, I, I see a little bit the same that Frederick uh, just talked about, in the, and that's about peer learning. Eh? So given the availability to people to make their own e-learning, uh, that helps us a lot to also get the knowledge of people uh, out there. So, so you can use the knowledge of, of our own people. Uh, not only our uh, colleagues from compliance make their own uh, compliance sessions, but also other uh, colleagues uh, who have uh, really interesting uh, content to, sh to share. So giving the uh, platform uh, availability, they, they can use it themselves. And uh, by using themselves, they learn, for instance, them themselves and learn a lot. <laughs> Uh, by teaching you learn, uh, but also uh, uh, really uh, connecting with other people and making groups and then getting the, the really the knowledge out there. That's that's a big benefit of giving that to, to the people. Mm. 
thanks Bart. yeah it's so true by by teaching you learn yourself um, mm -hmm. fantastic and I, I love the, the shifts that you guys are making that as you put it frederick moving from you to we um so you've got that much more collaborative approach yes in, in that sense i think it's the same here where we believe that hr just as a role to orchestrate, uh, but the learning has been driven by the business or by the function. So I think on paper, that's easy. Um, although in reality, uh, in those global companies, I think and not only the four of us, but also many people in the audience are, are working in, it is a continuous uh, uh, journey to keep on challenging people to, to open up, to share their insights, to share knowledge, to contribute to the learning culture. So if you ask me, Louisa, uh, um, making the shift to, to digital, uh, what are the benefits? Um, I think for us, it's still an ongoing process uh the real benefit for now is that we can have multiple let's say learning touch points so if we create a learning journey or a learning program or a learning path we still stick a bit to the sort of blended formats uh not only in class and virtual but also the, the difficult the different types of uh, virtual or digital offerings we have so i think that's a real benefit that we can create nicer uh, programs or pathways with a lot of touch points um, but still for us, the instructor-led component remains relevant just to talk about the learnings we had, talk about the e-learnings we have provided to really make sure the knowledge transfer will happen. Um, and in that sense, I think it's, it's a very nice, uh, nice journey. Um, whereas yes, in the you, me, we approach, I believe from the, the we part, a lot can be shared by the business, but still there's an important role to play for, for you me and maybe we to really uh, facilitate those uh, those learning journeys because to really change the learning culture um, within uh, these kind of organizations I think that uh, that requires a bit of longer term mm. uh, yes I'm also a happy man and it's, it, it's a good news but uh, I'm also puzzled a bit with finding the holy grail yeah no and I think for me as well I mean I, I really like the reverse the reverse classroom piece where you allow people to usually I say that you hold people hostage when you have them in training like face-to-face -face training and, and it sounds very negative but the thinking is that you have to be in a certain room at a certain time right so that if you can kind of like learn the theory on your own and I mean some are visual learners others need to repeat things then you can do that at your own time and at your own speed and how far or close it is and then you come to the classroom where you are both kind of like coached and kind of like graded at the same time right uh, so that you're kind of like getting your certificate as a negotiator or whatever, but you're also being coached while you are being kind of like given your certificate. So I like that a lot as well. Uh, and what we try to do with the, um, the the impact piece as well, we're working very close with the, the business and the business had already built, uh, I mean, whether it's sales or, or service, had built uh, their dashboards in one uh, tool. And then we decided that we were also going to build the training dashboards in the same tools so that we could really facilitate that correlation analysis, right? That you have both of them in the same place. And then things that we're doing then, uh, for instance, monitoring on an agent level. So uh, if there are first, there's an agent who's delivering a, a good service, hopefully, when consumers are calling in having problems. And then, you know, that you're rated with the whole MPS, you know, net promoter score. So what we do then is that we monitor the, the net promoter score for those individuals prior to the learning. And then we do probably some soft skills uh, training and service skills. And then we can monitor and follow the progress afterwards, right? So by linking it that hard, that's really good. Another thing that we're doing, and we're definitely not alone on that, is also that we are starting to monetize as well from the contact center agents. So they were very much these um, uh, service people supporting uh, individuals calling in. And now suddenly we're asking them to sell. Um, and then, of course, what I said in the beginning, you know, that we are instilling confidence, but the confidence is super important. And to have that confidence when you feel that, no, I'm not that pushy salesperson. So really to help them see by doing training then on the sales of, so for instance, selling fixed price repair, it's peace of mind. You know that you know what maximum, what you're going to pay. You're not going to have any surprises. If you want to offer that to your friend or your mom or dad, wouldn't you also want to offer it to our people around us? And then what we monitor then is the conversion rates on each of the agents, right? So bring it in like that, but not to put stamps, but really to look at um, developing, right? That we're setting them up for success and again, coming to their full potential, right? So I think that's really, really uh, interesting and so uh, fun to follow and be part of, I think. Mm. Thank you. So it's building that real end-to-end -end strategy, isn't it, around 
the whole the whole big picture of everything you offer and then how you monitor um, the impact that that's having. And I know you have some really good impact there, Cecile, as well. Thank you. So we kind of talked a little bit about what we've been doing and where we're at right now. I'm also interested to know how you see the future going. So what's next for you? Or what do you think the longer term future is for learning generally? And, and what will e-learning's role be in that future, do you think? Who'd like to go first? I mean, I can start. I mean, I will. Um, for me, I've seen a lot of questions popping in the in the chat, so I will mm. try to answer in one word. I see a lot of questions about LMS, uh, and my gut feeling, and it's something I've shared last week during an event. I don't believe in LMS anymore. For me, the future is not linked to LMS. It will be much more what we call LXP and LRS, and in between, you will have an LMS that will be operated for your classroom training or some clans, some compliance uh, modules. But you will also have a lot of bunch of. Uh, uh, I mean, systems, uh, online platform that are providing a dedicated experience. So that's my first uh, feeling about it. It's really not anymore relying on your okay. on Yeah. Before you move on, would you mind just briefly explaining the difference between an LMS and an LXP? Just because okay. I know we've got a mix of people in the audience from different levels of um, knowledge of LMS. Yeah, sorry for that. So LMS, it's a learning no, management okay. system. It's uh, something that has been starting to be designed late 90s. Uh, now it's kind of been big corporation, massively used for the last 20 years. Uh, it's big system um, used to manage uh, classrooms, uh, online stuff. And, um, and on the side, and what you see now, it's what we call LXP for learning experience platform that bring much more, I would say, value links to the user experience. Sometimes it's bring AI. Uh, you can see concept like you find in Netflix or YouTube about uh, channels, uh, I mean, bringing social parts. Uh, that's one concept. So it's really bringing a, a user experience. So that's the first thing. And on the other side, you have the LRS for the learn, learning record store where you bring all the data. And in between, you will have your learning experience. And we see massively uh, coming new players that providing learning on their own platform that you will use and consume on this platform. So now the end game will be how you bridge the coherency from a corporate standpoint and how you're getting the data. So that's one key element uh, about uh, the LMS. And uh, and when it comes to the UX part, a lot of things will be to really um, how you architect your content, how you, you, you build the design. So you use technique that you see, I mean, outside. So that's one thing. Um, and the last one, it doesn't mean that even if I'm doing digital for a long time, it will replace everything. And I'm always using this example. You used to have magazine, then radio, then TV, then internet. No one has killed the others. They all are working together and we are getting the best of one for what it is. So that's what I see. We'll see a balance between classroom and digital, maybe more digital, but in new format. Yeah, great analogy. Thank you. Very, very clear. Thanks for explaining that so clearly. Maybe on top yeah. of what uh, about you go. No, you go, you go. Thank you. I think for that. So I think on top on the uh, learning experience platform, I think Frederick uh, lines that quite quite nicely. So thanks. Um, what I think we need to do a bit more, at least in our organization, is also to think about the engagement, right? So the experience can be good, right? With the, the Netflix uh, kind of look and feel, some gamification uh, to make sure you get credits while you learn and these kind of, of nice things. But moreover, I think if you look how we all work on collaboration platforms like Office 365 and Teams and what have you not, um, there's a lot of engagement in, in tagging each other, in making sure you involve the ones you think are uh, are interested in potential learning pieces. I think that's really where we can also orchestrate more from the learning function, that you really make sure that everybody's engaged in learning to drive not only the content piece, but also the culture around it. But that takes some time and that also takes alignment from both HR and IT because in the end, we all look at the IT landscapes we have and we have so many different um, uh, technology pieces available for, for our workforce that we need to find the right blend or the right uh, integration between the different content pieces. So it could be a learning management system with a learning experience platform, but also maybe uh, Teams, for example, or Office 365 or other tooling. And that in the end, you need to build together with IT infrastructure, IT architecture, these kind of functions from your own company to really make sure you have a holistic experience for your learners. Yeah. 
Yes, and and, and I agree. I agree also with Frederick that that all the uh, um, items will still remain. So for me, it is a good example with Netflix because you have so much uh, offerings on on Netflix that you uh, you have too much to choose from, and then it's difficult also for people to choose. So I I really. Uh, think that that our role will be still there fortunately <laughs> to help the people also to uh, to, to look where, where where what's your development what would you like to uh, develop uh, what would you like to reach and and to help in, in suggestions and and I see in in, in our company as well uh, providing a LinkedIn learning there's a lot of e-learnings we still have a, a SharePoint page up front of it to to help people to uh, uh, to make make a choice in all that uh, offerings that that there is uh, if somebody wants to learn on a certain topic, then we can suggest, okay, others have done this. So please uh, look at that as well. Um, uh, systems can help on that. But uh, for instance, I've got an LMS that also has machine learning, but people don't go through the LMS for all their offerings. So then there's not a lot of content uh, data in there. So then the machine learning is not working. Yeah. So still we need to, we need to help people uh, uh, on, on, on giving direction. Yeah, no, and I fully agree with you as well, all three of you, because we're all saying the same, right? But I think that that part about curating content and part of being like that quality person that has looked through, so it's not just kind of like a little bit here, a little bit there, and it's someone who talks about it, we don't even know if they know what they're talking about, if they have any proven records, etc. So it's that mix that we could be there to not like put a, but maybe put like a quality stamp, but also to guide our learners. And, and we had the exact same experience, as you said, Bart, that we started with this... Um, uh, Netflix view on our uh, platform and we were like oh this is so cool and then of course you come there and you're a salesperson and it serves up something in Danish which is super technical and I'm like but it is because of course with Netflix you know what movies you like you know the you know the authors and all of that right uh, but then I've seen now is when because now it's more what Apple TV is becoming and I'm not promoting anything at all but what you see there is if you go into Apple TV, then it shows you what you're looking at in Netflix, in Via Play, in HBO, and in your, uh, you know, your uh, local kind of like TVs, etc. Uh, but then again, we have that part where nothing is going to cover everything, right? So it's it's a mix of that. Um, and I'm, I mean, like the biggest learning engine we have is YouTube, right? And there are anyone who's anybody, and I mean, at age 30, if I want to do makeup, I can learn from this 11-year-old in New Zealand, right? Uh, so it's really fun to see that part about the curating as well. Um, so I think yeah, guidance and, and support and be a bit of a, yeah, not streamline, but more kind of like help people get the path. And we have the same as well. We don't have LinkedIn learning. We have content anytime. Uh, it's the same thing, right? We have 2,500 trainings. But where to start um yeah so until the ai gets really into everything that we use outside of work so it actually feeds up from what i do across my life and it really becomes on demand and profile i think we have to help until that kind of like gets there the technique is up to date I agree. Uh, but then uh, to look back to my previous point, and not because I want to make the point, but I think it, it helps in this conversation because also in the chat, I saw some questions about the quality of content. Yeah. Because I fully agree that that's, that's partly with the learning function, but for us uh, in the energy business, for example, safety is important. So if yeah. there's anything related to safety, we always have a check from, uh, from the safety team to make sure it's in line with our standards. Yeah. But if you have the right learning engagement in place, I think people will drive the content catalog themselves. Yeah. So if someone did some good learnings, he can recommend and he can share with his team, with his peers, with also maybe people out of the business. Yeah. Um, and then I think, uh, uh, yeah, you can sort of have, have a nice control system in place. Uh, yeah. that's also in our organization, we try to open up as much as possible, uh, where people can share what they like to share. But in the end, it turns out people are a bit hesitant. Um, I think we it, it's a bit like LinkedIn. I think all of us are on LinkedIn. Um, we never post really silly stuff right you always overthink before you post to your whole audience oh, wow. in our company it's a bit the same with the learning system mm. where you can create lessons where they can share stuff also via age generator for example this far uh, we didn't have seen any uh, stuff which was not really up to par so i think by opening up let's see what will happen but so far so good uh, and in the end uh, uh, let's see what the future will bring yeah, and I think adding just to the easy generated part as well, because that's also why we chose, I mean, it's a good name for what it actually is, because what we want, it was the same as you guys, we didn't just want trainers or, or people are working with it, but we want the experts to be able to, you know, go around their own areas as well. So I think we have something like 270, 80 people and they're producing 
lots and lots and lots of uh, e-learnings that are then being used locally or and when we see that something is trending and and one of the things that i like about our lms is that you can do star rating of the trainings as well so then you kind of get that community piece as well right because if your peers have also if you have similar role as you are with the ai uh, setup right if they like this and they would uh, advocate this then i will also trust to look at that data right so that's helping us a lot yeah Agree. Yes, there, there are a great numbers, uh, silly, uh, with uh, using Easy Generator, but I, I, I agree on, on that part. The Easy Generator is, is in the name, but it's very easy to use. So uh, that helps us also people thinking about uh, creating content. Mm. And that helps also a lot in, in uh, trying to find the topics and the trends there are in the company. Yeah. Yeah. And lower that threshold, right? So it's not like, oh, I have to learn a new tool. Oh, no. Okay, I don't do this. But then when you see, oh, okay, it's like more or less PowerPoint, but it looks better. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and to come back on that, and it's also something that we wanted to do, and I'm always trying to figure out how to solve this issue, is how we fix the shadow learning. So yeah. it means the learning that is happening without the L&D team. Mm. And if you, I mean, and in, if you, I mean, straight to the point, it's PowerPoint. Yeah. And everything is happening in PowerPoint. You don't master the knowledge. Mm -hmm. You distribute document that is always updated. You never know what's the latest version. Mm. And that was, was the key element for us, for the SME, to lock the content, yeah. to make sure we have currency all across the organization when we distribute this type of learning. So even the shadow learning, what I call, they are using this tool now to lock and secure the content. And I think yeah. it's key also because, mm. I mean, I mean, uh, this is nothing worse than training people on training materials that are wrong. So yeah. that's also, I mean, something amazing with this solution. Yeah, and then they're not going to come back, which is a good thing, right? So, I mean, we have to keep it interesting and, and engaging, right? Yeah, absolutely. It helps make things more interesting and engaging in a really easy to use way, doesn't it? Thank you. So I know we have lots of questions coming in from the chat already. Um, if you do have other questions you'd like to submit, feel free to use the Q&A pane to do that and we'll come on to address some of those questions in a moment. Before we do that, I know our panelists have shared lots of words of wisdom and lots of tips already, but I wanna ask you or give the opportunity to share one last tip or one last nugget that you think for, for our audience, which are um, many people that are looking to go along that same journey of transformation for learning as you are, what guidance or tip could you could you offer them to help them on their way? Cecile. All right, see, now I got to start. Now it was the hardest <laughs> question. That's not fair. No, so I, I think that uh, my, my, or I'll do this. I worked in one of my companies previously. I had a um, project uh, office head for the, the full organization, for the full company. And uh, he was very set into that. Okay, Celia, I hired you to do this uh, project manager career model and then the training program that goes between each. Typically, I would see a full week of, you know, face-to-face -face training, that and I'm like, Oh yeah, like that, that's not what I think is going to be a good solution. But he was like quite set in his set that no, the only way to learn is to be face to face practicing. I mean, product management, of course, how can you do that in theory looking at a video, right? Uh, and then uh, I got him on um, training that was fully digital. It was in the evening here because it was run in the US and it was really simulations and it was other project office heads from other big uh, companies. And the way that he flipped already that first evening, he was sitting there, you know, from, I think it was like nine to 11 in the evening. He already worked the full day. It's not like the most interesting thing you're gonna do. He was on fire. And to see that transformation. So I think like if you find, it doesn't have to be like big things, but like a small kind of thing where they feel, uh -huh. I learned this little thing, it doesn't have to be big. And it actually made me change or made me remember it in my next dialogue with my, employee or whatever it could be, right? So I think if you can find just a small little thing like there where you get this, shit, could have done this better. Because then you yeah. learn, right? So I think if you can get some of those and then otherwise it's always the uh, Miss United States uh, competition, right? Not world peace in this case. It is to get your senior management on board uh, so that they are the ones preferably to get those ahas to pave the way, right? So that they really live like they learn. But if they don't do it, then the rest of us will. So we're gonna mm -hmm. save the world anyway. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, just maybe slightly another angle. Huh? So the question about um, uh, how to how to uh, drive and be successful with e-learnings, I would say 
for our company, um, we had quite some user generated content, but everybody who finished off his or her e-learning comes to me and say, Michiel, this has to be mandatory. This is so good. Oh. Everybody needs to do it. <laughs> Super. Uh, nice, huh? because then I think people yeah. have their own uh, um, uh, created pieces. Um, but I would say just go beyond the mandatory e-learnings, so beyond the different procurement, informatics and compliance and from safety, but start also a bit small with some stuff related to soft skills. So think about what kind of skills are relevant for your business, for example, diversity and inclusion uh, or something else, and try to pilot a bit with some interesting knowledge pieces, which you can put into each generator, which you can share across the line. And I think by doing so, it's becoming more fun and also more relevant for your workforce. Because if you stick to those, let's say hard scale dry materials, which are very good and um, uh, very needed, but if you want to go beyond, also think about some uh, appealing uh, soft skill pieces. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe to add as well, um, well, uh, getting a group of ambassadors together who, who uh, will work on content that will work. Uh, people are, are already enthusiastic about uh, the topic that will work as well. And also the topics, so I agree on that uh, with Michiel. Uh, we, we, as an asset management company, we are uh, really focusing on uh, sustainable investing uh, and, and uh, by uh, making sure that we also do a uh, walk the talk uh, in our company, then we have a, a, a a great amount of e-learnings made by uh, colleagues are themselves uh, on this topic. Uh, and then they also make sure that others will, uh, will look at it. And also the question uh, is raising that it should be mandatory because it's a <laughs> great content. Mm. So I, I can relate to that as well. But getting, getting a, people, a group of people who are enthusiastic about it together and, and make sure that topic is also uh, something that's, that's running in, in, in the company. That are both two tips, I think, yeah. And for me, I will give uh, one tip, but uh, I will say I have a lot, but on, on one topic. It's, um, it's not because it's digital that is easy and not costly. So think about that first, because I've seen a lot of production. People say it's digital. Let's go. And you mm. get uh, really bad content, bad production, and nobody wants to take it. So that's the first thing. So it will lead now to making organic content before making open, open to all keep it for a really limited group of people and make really cool production, high level production and raise the bar. Because as soon as you open that to everyone, if people want to use the tool and start doing their own content, they will want to reach a certain level and not be yeah. so different than the others. So really raise the bar at the very beginning and avoid when it's becoming organic content at first to have really bad content. So put the high expectation first because like that people will follow. Yeah. And and I've seen a question okay. um, and uh, I think it's quite important, mitigate, mitigate the risk. What I'm saying about organic content can work at Danone on some topic, but maybe not in your organization. So everything is, it's a question about risk mitigation. So for healthcare, compliance, yeah. uh, uh, safety, uh, guys, pay attention. Uh, it needs to be validated or they, otherwise you need to remove it. There is some topic when it comes to risk uh, people needs to be, needs to get serious. Now, if I'm doing a training on PowerPoint and how to use or whatever pivot table in Excel and I'm a master, let's do it, but really mitigate the risk when you do that. Yeah, good advice. Thank you. Thank you all for those top tips. I'm sure everyone's very grateful for them. Tessa, so we have Tessa from Easy Generator joining us as well. I know you've been keeping a close eye on the Q&A and the chat, Tessa. What yeah. questions would you like us to focus on? Yes, so I saw a lot of interesting uh, questions. So thanks everyone for, uh, for adding those questions into the chat and the Q&A. Um, yeah, some of them were answered in the in the meantime already, but uh, yeah, an interesting one that I uh, uh, noticed that I don't believe was spoken about a lot is the question, um, I'll read it out loud, would you say that in five years time with a great number of new trainings being created, you will be spammed with the overabundance of training which might not be relevant anymore? What then? So this has to do with uh, yeah, training material becoming uh, outdated. Any tips? or ideas on this? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think in the end, uh, if you look at my co-panelists, we uh, invested heavily in systems. Um, so when you have your systems ready, you never want to open an empty shop. So we really push out to make sure we have enough content in there, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to push or pull as much content in as possible. We try to encourage people to share and chip in as well. Um, so by building content libraries uh, and uh, sourcing content libraries, I think we can uh, serve our workforce. Um, at some point, you might be right. There can be an overkill in learnings. Although 
what I, when I'm a very happy man, if the learning system we have is the first source someone with a information need is going into. So I would like to open up as much as possible. So in case you look for a certain procedure uh, or whatever not, and that could be fine in the learning system, I think we do a great job because then you combine not only learning, but also with your knowledge management. And with operations around the globe, I think it's nice if we all can bring the stuff we have to one single source. So this is not the answer to your question, because maybe you come in five years and I have to admit that indeed there's too much information <laughs> there. But for now, I'm still quite happy that we just put in content. Uh, and also, again, uh, if it's a, it's a platform with all the information in there, uh, we go beyond the learning function and I will be a happy man. And what we do with the electrolytes is that, I mean, we have the, the dashboards that I talked about before, and that is really easy because then you can kind of like, you, you have like this line, you can take and I can say, see courses that hasn't been taken by anyone for the last year, for instance, and you can kind of like drag that to see, okay, two years, or uh, et cetera. And then we can look at them and is it because they have like bad rating or is it that they are obsolete, right? That they're not really, and of course on our products, then it usually, I mean, uh, maximum two years they should live with it but of course soft skills i mean they could still be super valid and maybe it's more to promote it to people uh that would be the target group for that training but we try at least to do that by looking at what the users are telling us that they don't care about and then see what we can do to either make it better or to make sure we don't have a churchyard of uh, trainings that you have to swim through to find that golden one that is all yeah we've taken this sorry do you want to go first no, just to add um, that I, I recognize the question because um, um, e-learnings are, are easy to make and, and there are a lot of topics you want to, to tell something about. So I can relate that, for instance, with the onboarding, uh, a lot of people want to send their information to new uh, employees uh, and you really have to be critical, but otherwise uh, they, they can I can fill in their first month they're only, only looking at e-learnings. So you, you, you need to be critical on, on those kind of uh, moments that you really uh, think about uh, not too much to people or send out uh, e-learns to people, make mandatory for, uh, so really be critical on what, to t what what should be mandatory, what should be sent out to uh, onboarding in the first month, maybe in the first uh, six months you do another one. So you need to be critical. So I can relate on the, on the question. Yeah. And I was going to say where we saw the biggest difference when I was managing that function um, was changing the approach to if we don't hear that it's out of date we leave it on there to if we don't hear that it's been updated or is definitely still in date we automatically yeah. remove it so getting a much tougher about clearing out things that are past a certain life date of two years max um, and only keeping them if they've been updated or we've been told they're they're good I mean, after that, I think in five years, I mean, I mean, the concept will change. And if you think yeah. about what is happening outside, I mean, giving you a straight example, Google, you don't remove anything from Google, but you're only finding what is relevant. Okay. So at the end of the day, I think it will happen the same story in the LND space. You will find automatically only relevant content. You will have content, of course, you will have to do some cleaning from time to time. But at the end, it will ban it by itself. Content will, I mean, get uh, exposed because you have a team of curators that are exporting the content and say, this is the one you need to do. And you will also have the content that is also found because it's social content. People are using it, uh, sharing, commenting, whatever, and you will expose. But at one point, for sure, you will have a content that will disappear in the, in the death of your LMS or whatever, because it's not used anymore. So it will be your choice to decide, I do cleaning campaign or I leave it there. But uh, you see that already in all the system, you do a bit of cleaning and the system will have, have the same type of logic at the end. Otherwise, uh, we'll have in trouble with all these massive online libraries with 20,000 content. If we have to do this cleaning, we'll, we'll have big problems. Yes, perfect. Thanks for those answers. Um, great. So another question I think is interesting as well is, uh, yeah, what strategies are you using to increase the active participation in online training programs? So, yeah, maybe most of it is organic, but yeah, any strategies in place here to make sure that people are using these e-learnings? Or well, maybe one of the strategies is to make sure that you uh, to combine it so uh, to to uh, uh, offline programs as well, uh, and, and make sure that uh, they they for start or maybe in between they can do some e-learnings. Uh, so you combine it with uh, uh, with other programs you have already. 
Yeah, no, exactly. And we also use competition a lot. So, I mean, now, for instance, we're prepping everyone in sales on what's going to come in Q1. Uh, so then to make sure, then we, of course, make a competition between all the countries. I'm Norwegian, living in Sweden, rooting for Norway, you know, and, and it's fierce. Like, it's madly fierce. They're like, but Cecilia, something must be wrong. I didn't get my four points on that one because that, and I've done it, I've done it. And and to get that kind of engagement, I mean, sales love to compete, don't we? Uh, but especially <laughs> when you do this more like a friendly competition competition piece right and we also have you know examinations like you have to have a pass rate at 80 uh, and then you get this gold star thing and then you can challenge others who also have the gold star so so things like that we're working with um and then i think that i mean of course number one the trainings have to be good and they have to be specific you have to be clear before they click how long it is what's the purpose for whom so that you really serve up the right content right uh, but yeah. then we know that it is so many things that happen and you know that in e-learning you can always do on Friday or the next Monday. So I think a little bit like you said, Bart, so to use the um, blended setup, but also to use live webinars so that they, if they're kind of thinking that, well, you have to be in a classroom to learn, webinars can bring them there, especially like a lunch and learn, not super long, but on something that, like we were talking about before, something that they really feel that oh, I'm actually using this now. Uh, and that can then, and, you know, we also have these e-learnings on the same topic that you can say, you know, like five minutes when you have time, we even have like uh, just the voice so that go out for a walk, have a listen to it, start putting your own images instead of having to do PowerPoints or e-learnings, etc. So, yeah, so I think that's kind of what we do. Mix it up, keep it interesting and yeah. engage them. Uh, otherwise, it will just yeah be on next Friday. I can say what we are doing uh, at Danone. So we have, we are using Facebook. For, I mean, workplace Facebook for everything. So yeah. everything is happening on on groups and stuff like that. So we have one person dedicated only to that, to user engagement. So we have groups, open groups for learning, and we have people posting every day. So that's how we start. Uh, now we have the, also the community uh, starting to post on a really regular basis to to really showcase their content, and we have trained the whole L and D team of the basic of community management and marketing or online marketing. I mean, using the same principle that you find uh, when you go on Netflix or Twitter and you see a post having the same technique to engage with the community. So it's not just uh, having a description. I mean, I mean, it's a description, but really having a great description, nice image, having the right tone. So it's a lot about that, uh, that we are doing. So there is, um, I mean, it's one of the key elements uh, to drive the engagement and then getting serious about online marketing. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting view of it. Um, yeah, also, now I know that uh, especially you, Frederick, and others have also spoken about uh, yeah, quality control and making sure that the information is, uh, is correct. There are many questions on this in the chat, and I see one as well uh, on yeah, how can we actually support the SMEs on didactics and on making sure that they're adding content that is uh, relevant and correct? How can we support them? Uh, this is a very good question, eh? um, but now you want an answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because in the end, uh, so when you open up with the tooling, um, you you sort of give people tools, and if you don't support them, uh, there's a risk that they don't write, especially if they're really into their personal topic or the yeah. person who wants to do at work. But I think um, Easy Generator, the tool we use, helps a bit because all the time you are forced to think about your learning objectives. Yeah. Um, also, beyond this generator, I think it's the first way we, from HR, always challenge the subject matter uh, expert, like what do you want to bring across, what is your key message, and sometimes I just send them actually to PowerPoint to prepare their key messages in PowerPoint, send it over to some, to me or someone from my team, that we can check whether it, it, it's relevant enough. But um, for me, it's always to start with the objective, and then next comes the content. And that's quite a big change, because those SMEs normally are really driven by the content, which you just yeah. want to bring across, but maybe some others have uh, other uh, views on this. It was a good question. Yeah, no, I can relate to that, Michiel, eh? that, that uh, you need to think about what you want to bring across and also uh, timing. And eh? so uh, if you if you prepare an, uh, an e-learning that uh, make sure that, that it is not too much <laughs> that people have to go through. Uh, so yeah, you help also with how to set it up. And, and each generator helps us with that as well. So that's, that's a big help for us. Yeah. 
And we also have, we have like a structure that you could start with. You can choose just to start, like do anything, but we have like a template ready so that you can like have a structure ready. But then just like you guys are saying, we usually have just a short dialogue with them. We have a few tips and tricks on when they're recording videos that they, you know, are engaging and that they are, uh, and in our case, I mean, with Europe, we have to translate more or less everything, right? So it's also that part that it's translation friendly. So you don't produce something that is so massive or, so cumbersome to to localize into the different markets um, so we do that as well but then some are super natural at this and they just get it right for and even better than ours from the beginning which is really great to see um on my side i don't have any other things to say that all has been said uh, the only thing that we are doing really to i mean in addition to what you said and um, and it's to come back on the organic way to proceed uh, we rely a lot on easy generator to do that for us <laughs> so the team is quite aware and spend a lot of time to unbark and connect directly with our users so i mean i said they, we don't have any silo so easy generator have a direct access to the end users in your facebook group to connect organization onboarding and everything so it's also relying on the ecosystem to to try to work by itself and of course, all materials to build, you know, guideline, description, and everything like that. But uh, also rely on your ecosystem to do the yeah. work for you. Yes, perfect. Yeah, I can confirm because that's my job. So, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Tessa. I know that. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, we've covered um, quite a few questions. There are still some more remaining, but uh, I think uh, we've covered what we could in this uh, in this hour. So, yeah. Any last words uh, from the panelists or from Louise? I think we've had some great wisdom from the panelists and I hope it's been very useful um, to our audience to give them some tips to go away with and some thoughts for the future in terms of successfully implementing a training strategy that works going forward.